A very good afternoon and welcome to the first webinar from Sensei. Today's topic is how to age healthily and how to do so in an economically and financially friendly way. I'm Arun Gimnag from Sensei and today I'm joined by one of our experts, Davida Sivisa James. Davida, very good morning to you. Good morning to you and thank you so much for having me on. Always a pleasure. So, Davida comes with an extremely, um, I would say, fantastic background that makes an ideal guest on our show today. She was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and she's lived in New York City, Los Angeles, St. Thomas, U.S. Virgin Islands. She has an English degree from UCLA, and she attended the Penn State Dickinson School of Law in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. She's also an award-winning short story author for a short story, The Commute in Volume 14, of the Caribbean Writer, which is also a Pushcart prize-winning issue. She has very recently embarked on an extremely powerful project. She has used her personal experiences, in-depth research, and she has written a book titled Senior Services for the Financially Challenged, and it's released on February 27th, 2018. It's almost uh, three months now. It's available on Amazon.com, print and Kindle formats. And also BarnesandNoble.com as well. So we're gonna have a great time today for the next half an hour. Uh, before we get started, just want to remind everybody that today's Sensei webinar is sponsored by LifeStation, a nation's premier provider of medical alert systems. So, Davida, let's kick off with the, with the question, what is healthy aging? Well, that's a wonderful question, and I think healthy aging has several components to it. Uh, quite often we, we say healthy and we tend to think of physical. And certainly your physical health is a very important part of aging. But there's also your emotional health. There are your relationships. Um, what is your relationship like with your family, with your friends? Um, what quality of life do you have with the person who is your love interest, your significant other or partner or spouse? And so I think all of that goes to healthy living and certainly your own financial health. Um, but it, it is all those things combined to form a holistic approach to our lives. I think one of the things you definitely want to think about, especially as you age, is are there important relationships that were in my life that I've let fade? And perhaps uh, you want to try to remedy some of those, maybe make it part of your bucket list that you go back and uh, perhaps try to patch up uh, some differences that you've had with either family members or close friends and people that you loved. And so I think all of those things combined for healthy aging. Now, you mentioned relationships with the loved ones. So let's uh, uh, start with uh, many people, especially millennials and Generation Xers, um, they often don't realize that their parents might be needing help. So for the benefit of them, what are the most common signs that an elderly parent uh, is showing that will make us understand that, wait a minute, our parents need assistance and help. Well, you know, what happens quite often when you're aging and you begin to understand that you're just not the person you used to be. Uh, I think, first of all, the parent notices it. But people are very good at hiding what they don't want you to see. Indeed. We're all good at that, no matter what age. Yep. But the older you get and the more you have a sense of your own mortality and that things are changing, you can hide from your loved ones certain things that aren't going right anymore just because you don't want them to worry about you. You know, there's always a sense you don't want your children to worry about you. As parents, you're the ones who are supposed to be taking care of the children. But one, because some of these things are very obvious, some of the changes and some very subtle, I think it's the subtle changes sometimes that you have to be even more on the lookout for. Um, if, if you notice that your parents are forgetting major family events, 
something really big in the family that happens. And then suddenly they say, oh, I didn't know that. Um, that can be alarming. I had that happen with my father. And uh, it can be a bit of a shock. And sometimes I think we can brush it off and say, oh, you know, they're older and they're getting forgetful. Um, if you see that there are certain habits that are changing, if you had parents who were very active, say your dad was always playing golf or always swimming or whatever, and you see some changes to that physical activity when this was a very, very important part of their lives, um, that's something to be on the lookout for. And also, I, I think um, if you had parents, say a, a mom or a dad, who was very meticulous about the way they used to keep the house, not a speck of dust, everything in place. And then suddenly you begin to notice that things are just not up to the standard that you know your parents would normally have the house. Uh, those are all signs that you may want to just take a closer look and just be on the lookout, ask some questions, just be a bit more attentive because those are some of the small signs that I certainly missed in my father's life and um, might have known a little bit sooner that he had dementia. So your advice <coughs> to millennials and Generation Xers, especially those that have a very close relationship with their parents, is to constantly, A, keep the communication channels open, but also look for patterns, look for trends in anything that's abnormal. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of, if you think about it, the same thing we do with our children. Yeah. You know, you, you look for things that are changing. Well, this is out of character. And so it is the same thing with our aging parents. What's out of character? Uh, why is mom doing that? Why is dad doing this? How come all of a sudden mom is uh, burning a, a dish that she's made for decades that was perfect or oversalting it or whatever? So again, the changes can be very, very um, extreme and you can notice them right away or they can be more subtle. And I do think sometimes it's the subtle changes that you want to be even more aware of. What are the various uh, non-medical interventions that can help that person live healthier? Like what can we encourage our parents to do? Like take up a new hobby or encourage them to socialize or help them build a network of like-minded people? Tell us, give us a few examples. Well, you've actually just answered it. <laughs> All of those things. Um, you know, aging is, is, is not easy. <laughs> uh, the older you get, it's easy to uh, isolate yourself. Uh, it's very difficult as, as you age to begin to see uh, some of your friends passing away, uh, having a sense uh, that the people who you were so close with that you used to share experiences with aren't there anymore. So certainly getting out and encouraging your parents to just try new things. Um, you know, senior citizen centers are incredible resources. It's a chance to meet new people. They, they arrange trips. There's all kinds of activities and speakers. And so um, any kind of social network, sometimes even through a church or something, uh, where you can encourage your parents to just be out there and to uh, be open to new things. Um, games, puzzles, things that engage their mind. Um, a lot of experts will say that things like crossword puzzles or Sudoku or other activities. I know when I first started getting, when my father uh, came to live with us when he was 87, and of course, you know, it was my experiences with my father that prompted me to write the book. Um, he, he was really tickled when I started getting puzzles. And he would start pointing out to me, I got this section over here, and look, I got the bird's eye, and you know, so it amazed me that a man as sophisticated as my dad would all of a sudden be into puzzles. But again, you know, things change. And so anything I think that you can do to just help them be more engaged on a social level in terms of being open to meeting new friends and also just, you know, um, with the family, try to visit more often. Uh, you know, take advantage of FaceTime and Skype. <laughs> so. David, uh, thank you very much for that.
Uh, just a reminder to our viewers and our listeners that this webinar is being brought to you by Sensei, a financial education platform targeted at millennials and Generation Xers. And this webinar is being sponsored by LifeStation, the nation's premier provider of medical alert systems. Let me a quick <coughs> segment, and this is probably very close to your heart. Your new book, Senior Services for the Financially Challenged. Now, let's take a step back. We have gone through the credit crisis. We've seen many people lose jobs. Um, we've seen almost two or three generations of people at various age groups take a hit uh, and have gone through the recession. Now, obviously, almost 75 to 80 percent of our population today, they are either struggling for themselves or they're struggling to plan their parents' uh, post-retirement, old age, well-being. Um, what are the various ranges of assistances that are available? If you wouldn't mind just going through the short list and what are the price ranges and just tell us, you know, to what extent Medicare can help or any other services in this country can help. Well, if we're talking about, um, I assume that has to do with assisted living, and if your parents reach the stage where um, you realize that assisted living might be the next step for them, um, that is certainly not going to happen for all seniors. Obviously, there are a lot of seniors that age gracefully, and that's never really an issue. But assisted living costs, first of all, to answer your questions, Medicare uh, does not have anything at all to do with, with long-term care placement. Medicare, and that's one of the things that I talk about in my book, the fact that a lot of times, for many of us, we don't know the difference between Medicare, Medicaid, Medi-Cal, whatever it may be. And so it's a learning process when you're suddenly in a position where you have to help an aging parent with issues like that, a parent or a grandparent with issues like that. So Medicare is strictly medical. It's your doctor's visits, hospital uh, prescriptions, whereas Medicaid is the plan for low-income people in general, but specifically for what I'm de I was dealing with, with low-income seniors. And for, for people who are on Medicaid, there is an assisted living waiver program, and Medicaid actually pays, I want to say, almost 80, 90 percent of the cost for an assisted living facility, and that can be a five-star facility. If you are in the position where your parents do eventually need to go into assisted living, an, an inexpensive one, very inexpensive, where you're talking about two people sharing a room and sharing a bathroom, uh, can be anywhere around $2,800 to $3,000 a month. That's inexpensive. Uh, when you're talking about one of the better facilities, you could be in the range of four to $5,000 a month. And then from there, just let your imagination soar. It's always going to depend on the quality of the facility, where it's located, what kind of services they have, whether or not the person has their own studio apartment, their own room and a private bath, but these things are also determined by region. Uh, just like where we pay rent or buy a home, uh -huh. uh, you know, what you pay for a home in Los Angeles or in Manhattan is going to be very different than the price of a home in South Carolina or Ohio or Nebraska. Um, regional costs are always a factor. So you may indeed get something, um, a much higher quality facility and living space in a different part of the country than you will in some of the major cities. But the costs for assisted living can absolutely bankrupt a family if, if you wind up in that position. And I think that when it does get to that stage, it's one of the reasons you may want to begin to explore whether or not it's better to keep the person in their home and possibly provide as many services as possible in home rather than going to assisted living. So it depends on the condition of the senior, uh, what state they're in, how much help they need, 
uh, what their financial resources are, what the family can contribute. There are a lot of factors that you need to examine when you, if and when you do reach that point. Right. Now, just for the benefit of our listeners, uh, would you be able to just talk us through how the Medicare works and what does it cover, especially when it comes to medical alert systems in general, like communication with the hospital or your loved one. Is that covered by Medicare as well? Uh, well, again, Medicare is, is doctor's visits, hospital stays, mm -hmm. and prescription drugs. Got it. Medicaid, if a person is on Medicaid, will often cover additional items that are not covered with Medicare. Um, for instance, if someone is on Medicaid and they needed a hospital bed, mm -hmm. okay, that's not something Medicare will do, but Medicaid would pay for that. If they needed a shower chair. So there are many supplemental items and perhaps medical alert systems would be one. I'm, I'm, that was not something that I needed for my father, so I don't want to speak out of turn. But I do know that there are sometimes services and equipment that Medicaid will cover that are not covered by Medicare. Medicare is strictly your doctor, your hospital, and prescription drugs. So, um, you know, but I, but I remember telling an aunt of mine, I encouraged her for so long to make sure that she did get a, a medical alert system because she was actually like one of those commercials. She literally fell and sat on her step for about four or five hours before anyone noticed that she was sitting there. And I think it was shortly after that in a stay in the hospital that she finally did get a medical alert system. And I had been trying to get her to get one for years and, and she wouldn't, it was a sense of pride, but she finally did, so. How would, when is the topic of finances are important to bring up? And reverse mortgages, which is for the benefit of our listeners, means taking cash out from the equity that you own in the house, but not having to pay it back. Could you explain how reverse mortgages work and why is it important for elderly people, for homeowners to understand it? Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm in the process of writing an article that I like to call the reverse side of reverse mortgages. Um, I have personal experience with that. And so one of the things I would say is that uh, with as with anything, there's good and bad. I think that too often seniors see those handsome old actors on television and think, oh, wow, he's trustworthy. If he says reverse mortgages are great, let me do that. Um, but one thing that you said is absolutely not true in terms of you take the money out and you never have to pay it back. There are, for a lot of seniors, I would say this, most of us always want to stay in our home, whether it's a studio apartment or the home that you've raised your children in um, and brought your bride or husband home to. Most people want to stay in their home as they age. And there is a serious issue when a senior gets to a point where there is this heart-wrenching decision that has to be made by family members. Is it time to put mom or dad into an assisted living facility, but they want to stay home? The reason why I began to think recently about the issue of reverse mortgages is that if you have a parent that does own their own home, and there is such an emotional attachment that they want to stay home. The one thing about reverse mortgages, assuming that they still have a, a mortgage on the home and they're paying a mortgage, is that any money that you, you free up in a reverse mortgage uh, might be an opportunity for you to think about bringing a caregiver into the home to help them at home. And I think that's something that the family might want to explore because there there is a huge emotional thing that happens when you place someone in an assisted living facility. They have the sense that they've done something wrong and why are they here, there and they want to go home. So um, again, I'm not a, a, an advocate of reverse mortgages, but I will say this. Some of the things that it, it are good 
and that are a benefit is that it does free up the money that you would have been paying for mm -hmm. a monthly mortgage. You can get a lump sum. But remember, that lump sum is coming out. That money that you take out is coming out of the value of your home. It's coming out of the equity of your home. And when you do a reverse mortgage, there are also big closing costs. Just like when you buy or sell a home, um, they don't mention on television the closing costs. That closing cost is coming out of your equity. And the thing that you don't think about, even though the home stays in the family and uh, you have an opportunity to sell it when your mom or dad passes and it's still in the family, um, you also want to think about the fact, and I do have a section in the book you know, where I kind of go through those steps very quickly, that while you're not paying a monthly mortgage anymore, there is interest that is building up on the back side of that loan. But so in, the in value short, begins to decrease. But in, in short, if a family today is very keen to ensure that the elderly family member wants to stay in the home and there's either a little bit of mortgage left, so there's a lot of equity there, but still finances are short, um, reverse mortgage could be a good source of immediate funding that could see the elderly person through at least for the next five to ten years. It absolutely could okay. because any of the money that you get as an advance could mm -hmm. possibly um, you know maybe help them with having a caregiver in the home. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, for those purposes and again, this is something you want to discuss with a financial advisor, uh, with an estate planner, sure. um, all of those things. You Absolutely. want to make sure of that. Absolutely. But yes, that is one possibility as a way of keeping a person in their home yes. and then helping them to get all the services that they need in the home to live a safe life, to live a good quality of life. Okay. Now, a, a big problem that a lot of young people face um, Millennials, Generation Xers, is that we often know that our parent needs help. We ask them from time to time, Thanksgiving's dinner, Christmas, and they often disagree. Um, right. What should we do? You know, I think sometimes um, there's, first of all, there's no easy answer. There absolutely isn't. Uh, most of us, young or old, have a sense of, of pride. We, we want, want to maintain our dignity. And that's especially uh, true in aging parents who uh, will be very quick to tell you, I've always done this, or I've taken care of myself for 80 years or 75 years, and so I don't need you to tell me whatever. Um, you know, there is a reason why they say at a certain stage in a parent's life, the child can become the parent because you wind up parenting your parents. I think there are a series of conversations that will wind up happening and that those conversations will happen over and over because it is often very difficult to get your parents to understand that they need help. And some of these conversations can be embarrassing and unpleasant. I'm very, very honest in my book about the fact that Taking care of an elderly person in your own home, it's not fun. No. It's not easy. No. no matter how much you may have loved them, if you had a great relationship, that's wonderful. If you didn't have a great relationship, it can put even more of a strain on you, your husband, your wife, your children. So it's tough. I think that sometimes brutal honesty is the only way to go. There are times you can try a very gentle approach, a very loving approach to try to explain to mom and dad what's going on. Oh, mom, you, you, you set the, the microwave for uh, 10 minutes for a pancake. Um, did you notice you know, you're beginning to leave the gas on the stove? There are so many little things that you can point out. But I think that in terms of the relationship with a mother and son or a father and daughter, that you especially have an opportunity there to get them a little grounded, to make them understand the reality of, Dad, you need help bathing. Do you really want me as your daughter to be the person that has to do that? 
a, a, a son with his mother. I think that at times you have to incorporate a little tough love in getting your parents to realize that they need help and to try to do that in a non-aggressive manner and in as loving a manner as you can. But those are tough conversations, so there's no easy way to go about it. So all with the aim of not taking away their sense of empowerment. Absolutely. You, 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 ideally, you want them to be part of the decision that it is time for this. And as I said, sometimes that can be by just having some tough conversations. But the bottom line is that you want your parents to be safe. And so when you're having these conversations and trying to make these decisions, you have to also, and that, you know, maybe something you, may, you were going to lead to, but you have to make sure that you're in a legal position <laughs> to make those kinds of decisions for them. Absolutely. Um, in fact, it brings me to the a very sensitive topic, which is the money conversation. And I think, uh, again, uh, none, of us prepared, none of us are prepared for a recession, but I think today we are looking at a generation of people whose savings have probably been severely hit by the 2007-2008 credit crisis and they probably will not recover uh, in the next few years. Now, many, many people's parents are going to outlive their retirement savings as a result. How can we prepare them going forward? Like, if they can't afford basic prescription drugs, housing care, uh, what other resources that we should bring on people's radar to think about? Well, certainly one of the things that you want to understand is that if people find out very late in their lives that there's a crisis with their, their, their finances, sometimes it's a little difficult to reverse that. Um, it's part of the reason why you hope that young people have learned a lesson in terms of preparing early for their retirement. But it is true that a lot of people will um, outgrow their retirement. I think one of the things that everyone should do, and I'm no financial expert, so certainly that's something that you would want to discuss with the pros, but you want to have a budget. And as much as possible, you want your parents to be sensible about their finances and their spending habits and um, not only have a budget, but then have a plan A, B, C, D for if that budget changes, what can they cut back on? Um, are, are there little things that they can do uh, maybe to increase their income? Some kind of little small part-time job, even though unfortunately so many people have retired and they wind up going back to work. Um, you know, there are some home shopping networks that have almost bankrupt some people because you find that mom or dad are sitting there ordering all kinds of things that they don't need to. Um, so you want to look at that. You want to look at their assets and see uh, how perhaps they can shift some of those around. But again, if you see that there are things going on financially with your parents, and I'll give you a good for instance. Uh, when my father first came to live with us, and I was examining his bills and, you know, I, I did everything that I needed to immediately to make sure that I could help him with his finances. I was on his bank account. I got power of attorney while he was still lucid and his, his dementia was mild. You don't want to wait until someone is very advanced in dementia to start doing that or it'll look like you're trying to manipulate them. So, you know, I made sure that in terms of an advanced medical care directive that I you know, was the person on that. So you have to make sure you're in a position Absolutely. legally to help your parents. And I suppose, but I, and I, suppose, I noticed on one cable bill that my father was being charged for the internet wow. while he was still in Philadelphia. My father had never touched a computer. So obviously I was able to get the cable company right away to give him a two year credit for having charged an 80 something year old man for the internet. Um, and they just slipped wow. that on his bill. Wow. Um, so you do have to make yourself aware of what they're spending, what they're buying, um, and then just you know try as much as, as possible to guide them. And I suppose a part of this is also to ensure that your parents are sticking to a healthy lifestyle, right? 
Yes, it, it, it absolutely is. If you, if you have elderly parents that are uh, still drinking um, heavily or not, you know, most of the time beyond a certain age, you're taking some medication. So you want to be careful about that. Are they still smoking? You know, hopefully by a certain age, people have given up most of, of their vices. Uh, but again, healthy lifestyle can be challenging. And, and you had also asked about um, prescriptions uh, before, you know, in terms of their, their finances and their choices and can they afford this and that. I just wanted to say, you know, my family has always had an HMO. Um, and with an HMO, uh, you know, your doctor's visits are at the same place. Your hospital stay, if your HMO has their own hospital, that's all covered. You're never going to be presented with a $50,000 bill after hospital stay. Your prescriptions sometimes cost 5 or $10. Wow. So I think that when uh, you're helping your parents make choices, especially uh, about uh, their medical care, that when it uh, comes time for open enrollment for Medicare, and beyond a certain age, you can actually, I think at some point in your 80s, um, you can change plans, Medicare, senior advantage plans at any time. Uh -huh. But open enrollment is usually that October, November period. And when it does come time for that, you may want to sit down as a family and think about whether or not your parents want to consider an HMO because for one thing, the prescriptions are just so reasonable. Okay. Um, so that will certainly help cut down on those huge prescription bills. Just to kind of, um, as we move to the end of the show, uh, a couple of quick questions on, uh, is there a kind of a quick checklist that you can share that um, people should be aware of when it comes to the, it comes to the parents are following everything from a financial and legal perspective, like a living will or will? Uh, what are your ch quick top five or top six that things that people should be aware of? Well, checklists are important, and I and I did put a checklist in my book towards the end of the book because. Um, one of the most important things is to make sure that you're in, and I mentioned this, but it's a very important part of a checklist. Yep. Make sure you are in a legal position to make decisions for your parents. Power of attorney is very important. You may uh, want to become the payee in terms of their social security. The social security administration does not recognize power of attorney which came as a big surprise to me. Wow. So there is an entire process that I explain in the book about what it takes to become the social security payee, which basically means that your, uh, your, your parents' social security money would still go into their bank account, but it would have your name on it as well as the person who is responsible in managing their finances. Um, advanced care medical directive. When um, when your parent is admitted in the hospital, you know, we all have this sense that we watch television and you can rush in and say, you know, I'm his son. I, you know, yes, do the surgery or no heroic measures. You need to make sure that you are the person on that medical directive mm -hmm. because, you know, the neighbor next door could come in with a paper that says, no, I get to make those decisions. Yes. So. You know, these are difficult decisions to, to discussions to have, That's but they're important really ones. So you want to make sure about the medical care directive. Um, you also want to make sure in terms of their bank accounts. Uh, is there a, um, you know, who is the person, who is the other person on the bank account that could access the bank account? Uh, are you the beneficiary on the bank account or who is? Look at their lease. Look at their the deed to the house. Um, you may want to think about um, making sure that your parent has a life estate in the house, but that someone else's name is also on that deed. Uh, so in terms of their finances and all of those kinds of things. And very, very importantly, um, and I meant to mention this earlier, you always want to make sure that you are that you have a good relationship with your, your parents' doctor, uh, with their medical care providers, you, because the doctor can be your greatest advocate in any other kind of care that your parents need. So, you know, perhaps when one of the doctor's visits, you go with them to the doctor, you introduce yourself, you make sure that they're very aware that there is a daughter or a son there that is 
checking up on their parent, wanting to be aware, and that's a, another very important point in terms of the checklist. Make sure you know all their medications, Absolutely. what they're taking, what they're for, the doctor's names, and all of that, all of their conditions, surgeries that they've had, because you'll get asked those questions eventually. Um, did your mom or your dad have this or this and that? I always made sure I had a summary of everything that had happened with my father, uh, surgeries, conditions, medications. So those are some of the, the top things that, that I would say. Um, and let them know that you're there for them, certainly. Thank you very much. So I think we're almost out of time. I do want to remind our listeners that um, that was uh, Davida Sulisa James, author of the book Senior Services for the Financial Challenged. The book is available on Amazon.com in print and Kindle formats as well as in BarnesandNobles.com. A valuable source of information. Um, this brings us to the end of our inaugural webinar from Sensei, which was on aging healthily and was sponsored by LifeStation, the premier provider for medical health systems in this country. Davida, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And um, I'm quite honored to be your first webinar guest. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>